Now, it's very easy for us to lament the decline of our society and the growing difficulty of being a Christian in America. However, God is not any less powerful than he has ever been. The needs of his people are the same. The power of the gospel is as vibrant as ever. And the need of the hour is men and women who will live and pray according to the scriptures with a desire to see the world changed for the glory of God in Christ. God is still doing his work everywhere in the world and he will not be thwarted. Jesus is the king. This morning we'll see that Jesus is the king whose power to rebuke sin and accomplish God's will is shared by those who pray in faith without any doubting. Again, Jesus is the king whose power to rebuke sin and accomplish God's will is shared by those who pray in faith without any doubting. Faithful prayer infallibly accomplishes the work of God. Now, it's been a little while, so we need to review just a a bit of where we are in our text in Matthew 21. Jesus has finished his earthly ministry. He's finished his pilgrimage to Jerusalem. He will now finish the work for which he came into the world, which he had so specifically predicted to the disciples his torture, his death, his burial, and his resurrection to deliver his people from their sins. The book of Matthew now, as we had began in, in chapter 21, will record the events of what we call Passion Week, the eight days from Sunday to Sunday on which the entire salvation of the world turns. The first event that we discussed a month ago at least, was the entrance of the king. Remember, Jesus enters into Jerusalem. In doing this, he fulfilled prophecy that he would come humbly, that the king of Israel would come to his people on a colt. And Jesus specifically fulfills every one of the prophecies that was made hundreds and hundreds of years beforehand in proclaiming that he is the king. Remember, the the king receives the praise of the crowd as the Messiah, as the forever king in the line of David, as the one who represents God himself. They cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the son of David. This stirred up Jerusalem, remember, and they asked, who is this? Those who had come from outside of, of Jerusalem, who had not been aware of the work that Jesus had done in the country. Remember, they're coming for Passover, so they're coming from all over the world, literally, They are stirred up to wonder who is this who is being proclaimed the king, the very king of Israel. Well, you remember that the next event after that, after Jesus goes out of the city, then he comes back into the city, he cleanses the temple. He declares himself to be the king of his people, and then he declares himself to be the very God who is worthy of their worship. He is the God king. It's more than a political ruler, but never less than that. He's always and will be the ruler of the universe, the ruler of his people, the king of the temple, the one who is worthy of worship. And so he enters into the temple and calls it what? His house. This is my house. And you are using it as a place to sell, a place for commerce, when instead you ought to be using it as a place for prayer. And so he rebukes the people there and he cleanses the temple kind of a ceremonial cleansing as he removes the sellers of doves and those who are buying and selling various merchandise, the money changers who are cheating the people out of their money even as they change the money into what was necessary to make the sacrifices. Remember, the Jews had in this one place this court of the Gentiles where the Gentiles could pray. They couldn't go any further into the temple. They had removed the very opportunity for the Gentiles to worship God by turning the prayer, the place of prayer, into a house of commerce instead where they were gaining their, or they were receiving their own gain. All of this on the pattern, the the desire of the religious leaders who are driving what is now this false religious system. The temple is merely a shell in which a false religion is being practiced and Jesus comes to change that. So he cleanses the temple, he drives them out and then he, he, he receives the praise and worship of the people once again. He receives that in the temple. So if you'll drop your eyes uh, down to verse 14. It says, And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done and the children who were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became indignant. And he said to them, Do you hear what these children are saying? They said to him. And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes you have prepared praise for yourself. And Jesus receives the praise and worship that's attributed to Yahweh within his own house, claiming it to be his. We will never declare Jesus to be anything less than the sovereign Lord and Savior of the universe who is worthy of all worship and praise. We will not bow to the whims of culture when they try to force us into placing Jesus and his word underneath their gods and their words. Jesus would not, and we will not. So he receives the very praise of the of the, of the teenagers, of the young men who are there 
really he receives it as Yahweh himself. And then in verse 17, he leaves. He walks out of the city to Bethany and spends the night there, most likely with friends, either Simon the leper or perhaps Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So that's where we are. Jesus has entered the city proclaiming to be their king. He has entered the temple declaring himself to be very God. And now he will, will perform a, an, an unusual miracle, one that is, is, has confused and, and, and really in many ways upset people down throughout the ages as he curses a fig tree. It seems like a, a very mundane thing after he's done these amazing miracles. So we'll try to work our way through it in chronological order to try to understand why Matthew would record this particular miracle, this particular incident of all the things that he could have recorded during Passion Week. So we'll see the king's condition, the king's curse, the disciples' response, and the king's instruction. So first, the king's condition. Verse 18. Now, in the morning, when he was returning to the city, he became hungry. So what's his condition? He's up early in the morning. He's walking back into the city. Remember, he had left to uh, spend the night outside the city. Seems like he did that each evening, maybe for protection, maybe for, to, to have a, the, the uh, comfort of, a, of friends in a home when he's working in a hostile environment all day. Regardless, he gets up very early in the morning, apparently. He's going back into Jerusalem to accomplish the work. And this incredibly mundane statement, he became hungry. He's like, did, did we forget that Jesus became hungry? I mean, Jesus was a man like us. Uh, you rushed around this morning probably. You got ready to come to church and you didn't have time for breakfast. And on the way to church, you felt the hunger pangs start to kick in and you started looking for McDonald's. Well, okay, maybe not McDonald's, but something. And then you got here and you drank coffee and maybe tried to find a donut because you were hungry. It's a very mundane thing. And yet Matthew mentions this for a purpose, I think clearly for a purpose, to highlight this particular event, to, to give it a, an urgency that, that will help us understand what Jesus is actually doing. But let's remember Hebrews 4, 15. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has, one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. He, he knows we're weak because he gets hungry. He, gets, he, he got tired. All those things that happened to us in that sense happened to him. And it's just a fascinating thing that Matthew says. He's early in the morning, apparently didn't have breakfast, didn't have time for it. As he's walking into the city, he gets hungry. Which kind of leads us to be thinking, well, how's he going to deal with that hunger? So that's the next part of our, our narrative here, the king's curse. The king's curse. So that's his condition, early in the morning, ready to do ministry, hungry, having hunger pangs. And now verse 19, seeing a lone tree well, in fig tree by the road. He came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only. And he said to it, no longer shall there be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. <laughs> now, now this is a surprise. And you know the narrative. You, you are familiar with the book of Matthew. You've heard this story probably many times. And so maybe it doesn't surprise you, but it ought to be surprising. He's hungry. He goes to the tree. He's looking for his morning breakfast of figs, McFig, we'll call it. Um, <laughs> I don't think they have that even in, in India. They have different things, but they don't have that on the menu. Nonetheless, he goes to look. There's nothing there. And so, and what we maybe, if we didn't know better, could assume he was just angry, he didn't get his food. So what does he do? Instead of chewing out the McDonald's worker, like you do when you don't get your, exactly what you want, he curses the tree and it dies right there. I mean, it's just almost like, I, I can't even believe that that happened. And maybe for, if you were reading it for the first time or those, you know, to whom Matthew was writing, the reason for the first time going, what just happened? Jesus just cursed one of his own creations. It died. Now we know it says it died immediately. Our understanding is from the book of Mark. Matthew kind of compresses the time here that Jesus cursed it. Maybe there was some initial response to that that it began to wilt and other things. We know that actually then they go into the city, they come in the next morning and they see that the tree is entirely withered. So Matthew often does this. He simply compresses his time frame. Mark, the companion passage in Mark, reveals to us that uh, the tree took a day to wither. Right, or to wither totally. I think what we would understand is when Jesus cursed it, it immediately begins to wither, to the leaves begin to curl up and die, and by the time they get around the next day, the tree is entirely dead. So the king spots a unique tree, and I do want to point out from the grammar here, it says, seeing a lone fig tree by the road. Matthew appears to be highlighting the unique nature of this tree. It may have been the only one there, but probably more, he's pointing out that this tree was very unique. Why? Because it had leaves on it. And as Mark points out to us in, in his recording of this incident, it is not the time for figs. The leaves are not supposed to be on the trees. If, I mean, I'm not a farmer. I don't know much about fig trees and how they produce. But in doing my research, 
When a fig tree developed foliage, it meant that early figs were ready. It, it produced figs two times during the year. Right? Now, they wouldn't have been as good as the later figs the trees produced, but they were still edible. But the leaves and the figs came together. That's how that worked. So the fact that it had leaves on it at all, when it wasn't the time for figs, makes the tree very unusual. And so, of course, Jesus spots it and moves towards it because the leaves indicate what? That there's fruit. That's the idea. And I think that's the whole purpose of the narrative, right? Or at least this particular part of the narrative. Not, there's not leaves on any of the other trees. This is the only tree that has leaves because it's not the time for figs to be produced. When there were leaves, there were also supposed to be figs. That's the way that it worked. So Jesus goes in expectation of the fact that there will be figs on the tree. Of course, as the sovereign Lord of all, all right, knowing all things, all right, could have known that there weren't any at all. But acting as a man, acting as the full man that he was, he goes to look for the figs and there are none. So that's the second thing the king examines the tree. He came to it, and he found nothing on it except leaves only. Again, Mark 11 says, on the next day, when he had left Bethany, he became hungry. Seeing at a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if perhaps he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And we, I think sometimes we, we, when we read the book of Mark, it's like, well, okay, there, there were supposed to be, there could be leaves, but there were, you know, they didn't necessarily have to be figs. No, he says it's not the reason for figs to indicate both that there shouldn't have been leaves as well as the fact that there weren't figs either, right? It was unusual for it to have leaves. It was even, in, in that sense, it was just as, as unusual for it not to have any figs having the leaves. So essentially, the tree is falsely advertising. And one wonders if this in and of itself is part of the miracle that is going on here. It would be very rare for a fig tree with leaves not to have fruit. So Mark's comment here only highlights the treachery of the tree. Not being in season means that there should not have been leaves just as there were not figs. So the tree has given a false advertisement. Look, I have figs. Jesus goes to it. It doesn't have any. And so the king curses the tree. That's number three. He said to it, here's the curse, no longer shall there ever be any fruit from you. Essentially, he curses the tree in such a way that it dies. It will no longer bear any more fruit. Now, the reason, or the, Donald Carson says it this way, that it was not the season for figs explain why Jesus went to this particular tree, which stood out because it was in leaf. Its leaves advertised that it was bearing, or that it should have been, but the advertisement was false. Jesus, unable to satisfy his hunger, sees an opportunity for teaching a memorable object lesson. He curses the tree, not because it's not bearing fruit, whether in season or out, but because it made a show of life that promised fruit, yet was bearing none. So what's the, what's the result? The tree withered immediately. Right? Again, we know it probably began that process, then when they come back the next day, it's entirely dead. Now, just a couple of thoughts here before we try to figure out the lesson. So that's the result, the tree dies. Right? Jesus has, by the way, the right to curse the tree for not making provision. Why? It's his tree, right? He owns it. He created it. It's his, right? So he has that. Uh, if he desires to do so, he can. Additionally, Jesus is clearly not having a temper tantrum, right? He's not angry at the tree, some kind of sinful anger at this tree for not providing his breakfast. His being hungry explains why he went looking for figs, but not why he cursed the tree. That is, he was hungry, didn't get his hunger pang satisfied. Now he's mad, so he blasts the tree, Right? The idea that Jesus would flippantly sin in this way is patently ludicrous. Therefore, we need to approach the text to find a meaning beyond somehow Jesus having some kind of fit of anger. And so what's the lesson? That's the third part of your outline here. What's the lesson? Now, it may be that the only lesson to be found here is that Jesus is going to, make a, is going to teach on prayer. That's the direct lesson that Jesus himself draws when the disciples ask him about what happened. By the way, they don't ask him what he did or why he did what he did. They're amazed that the tree immediately withers. That may be the only lesson that's being made here. But because of the nature of the text, because Matthew chooses this particular illustration, a fig tree, right? Because it's, it's marked out as being a unique tree because of the nature of the leaves, the lack of fruit, and because of what Jesus has just done in announcing himself as king and in cleansing the temple, it would seem that there is something more going on here. Every single commentator that I've read views this as a kind of visual parable, and I think that's right. As I wrestled through the text to determine, all right, how, do we, how are we going to know? Because there's no explanation made here, and there's no explanation made in the book of Mark as to why the tree was cursed. Jesus makes an application to prayer 
about the power that he used to curse the tree. But it seems, would seem, best for us to understand that Jesus here is doing something like the Old Testament prophets often did, where they would do, make a, a visual example of something as a means of pointing to a spiritual truth that's going on. You have prophets who would buy a belt and hide it and it would decay and then they, they would make a lesson from that. And a variety of things that would happen in the Old Testament. So it seems very likely here that there is a visual parable going on, something that Matthew highlights in order to point out the fate of the nation of Israel, what is going on. So nearly every commentator, and I among them at this point, would agree that cursing the tree is a visual parable related to the cleansing of the temple and conveying a message about Israel itself. Well, well what would that message be? So if we're going to look to find what this visual parable might mean, not being directly explained by Matthew or by Jesus, I, I think there's two clues that we have that might help us understand that this is actually pointing or, or really comes in conjunction with Jesus' proclamation of king as he enters the city and then his cleansing of the temple and the fake and false religious system that he removes from there. So one echo would be found uh, in the Old Testament in Micah chapter 7. So go ahead and turn there. Micah 7. Here we have the prophet lamenting the state of Israel who should have been responding to their king and ultimately to the Lord. So he's pr pronouncing judgment upon them. And in Matthew chapter 7, there's a very fascinating incident, a, a, perhaps a, what Matthew is picking up on here as he and, and what Jesus is portraying as he finds, goes to find a fig on the fig tree and doesn't find one. Matthew chapter 7 verse 1. Or Micah, excuse me. Chapter 7, verse 1. The prophet says, Woe is me, for I am like the fruit pickers, like the grape gatherers. There is not a cluster of grapes to eat or a first ripe fig which I crave. The godly person has perished from the land, and there is no upright person among men. All of them lie and wait for bloodshed. Each of them hunts the other with a net. Concerning evil, both hands do it well. The prince asks also the judge for a bribe, and a great man speaks the desire of his soul, so they weave it together. The best of them is like a briar, the most upright like a thorn hedge. The day when you post your watchmen, your punishment will come, then their confusion will occur. Do not trust in a neighbor, do not have confidence in a friend. From her who lies in your bosom, guard your lips. For son treats father contemptuously, daughter rises up against her mother, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own household. And so at least there is an echo here of this idea of going to find fruit. It's not there as an indication of the kind of disappointment that Israel is giving to her God and really to those who are faithful in the land. So Micah 7 perhaps gives us a bit of a clue as Jesus goes to find a fig. It isn't there. His desire and expectation is that it would be, but there's a bigger picture. His desire and expectation is that his people would truly have received him as the king and would truly be living for him, honoring him in their work in the temple, and instead they aren't. They proclaim to know and to love him. Their religious system seems to be demonstrating a true love of God, but it's all fake. Nothing about it is true. Now perhaps even more strongly in Luke 13, we have a New Testament indication as to what might be going on when it comes to the idea of a fig tree here and what Jesus is pointing to. So turn to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 13, verse 6. And again, it is, it is from these clues that we are, are seeking to discern why this particular incident would be recorded, what its import is. Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 6, Jesus tells another parable. And he began telling this parable, a man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard and he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without, without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine, but if not, cut it down. I think it's very clear from the context of Luke that Jesus is speaking of the nation of Israel here. And that it has not borne the fruit of honoring and pleasing him, and certainly up to this point has not recognized him as the Messiah. And it's almost as though in Luke 13, it's like, you got a little more time. But now in Matthew chapter 21, their time is over. It's done rejected the king ultimately as, as we will see that will bear itself out in this very week even though they've proclaimed him to be the king and entering into the city they have already demonstrated the, the falseness of their religious system as the religious leaders castigate their own messiah in the temple and refuse to respond refuse to recognize who he truly is so it would seem that 
perhaps the best understanding of what Jesus is doing here as he curses this fig tree is representing the expectation of God that his people would respond to him. As they do not, he then essentially brings this curse upon the tree as a representation of what he is now doing to Israel in rejecting, in their rejecting him, he is setting them aside. There are no more chances. They're done. Israel's time is up. So, if this is a parable about Israel's rejection of the Messiah, despite her external religious activity, then it seems clear that Matthew is relaying the concept that Jesus had a proper desire for Israel to receive him as king. Their religious activity gave external evidence of their right relationship with him. Yet their rejection indicates that all their religiosity was no more than hypocrisy. Jesus then, with the simple act of cursing the tree and causing it to wither, indicates that Israel's time is up. Her rejection, in her rejection, she will be rejected and the plan for the Gentiles will now commence. I think that's the understanding of most commentators. I think it's a good understanding for us as we consider the nature of what Jesus is doing here because of Matthew's highlighting of this particular incident even before Jesus brings an explanation concerning the power that enabled this incident to take place. One more thought here. Some people would see Jesus as being a bit capricious and cursing his own creation. Right? Is, is, is that acceptable? Can the king do that? Well, we've already said it's his tree, so we can do that. And we really only have one other incident in the New Testament in which Jesus harms creation, as it were. You might remember that that's when 2,000 pigs are drowned in the sea as the uh, demons are released from legion and sent into them. And it is interesting that at that time, also, there is no explanation made for why that would happen. And so we have to bring our own, in one sense, bring our own understanding of why Jesus would allow the demons to go into the pigs and to kill them. And I think there's a good explanation of it. That's not for this morning when we talked about it. Uh, you can go back and take a look at what we discussed there. But nonetheless, the cursing of the fig tree is not out of character for Jesus, as some would have us believe. The same Jesus exercised demons so that 2,000 pigs were drowned. This is Donald Carson quoting. Drove the animals and money changers out of the temple and precincts with a whip, and he says not a little about the torments of hell. Perhaps the fact that two punitive miracles, the swine and the fig tree, are not directed against men should teach us something of Jesus' compassion. He would save his people from their sin and its consequences, resorts to prophetic actions not directed against his people in order to warn them of the binding power of the devil, that is in the destruction of the swine, and of God's enmity against all hypocritical piety and rejection by his own people, the cursing of the fig tree. Well, that's the best I can do to bring what I think is a good understanding of why this incident is here in the cursing of the fig tree. However, it is true that the text does not specifically state that reality. So now let's move on to the disciples' response. And that's where Jesus focuses most of his time, clearly. And that's where Matthew focuses his time. So now let's look at the disciples' response. Back in Matthew chapter 21. So what did they draw from it? Right? So what, what were they thinking when Jesus cursed this fig tree? They say, the verse, verse 20, seeing this, the disciples were amazed. Again, they're blown away, but, but by what? The fact that Jesus actually did this? No, they're amazed at the power that went out from him for the tree to instantly die or to begin to die immediately and then to be totally dead by the next day. They're amazed not at what Jesus did, and I think that possibly that continues to indicate their own misunderstanding, perhaps their spiritual blockheadedness. And they're not paying much attention to the cursing of the tree and what that might mean. They're just like, wow, that's amazing. You killed a tree, which is a lot like most of us. Right? We tend to look at things. Which we're amazed by things that probably we shouldn't be. But it is, again, fascinating that Jesus doesn't take the time to explain to them. He doesn't say, no, you misunderstood, or you, you don't know what's going on, or why are you just amazed at my power? I, I've done powerful things. I mean, I do them, I've done them for you continuously. I mean, I've, I've raised people from the dead. Why is a tree such a big deal to you? But every time he exhibited his power, they were amazed. And so Jesus answers them. This is the king's instruction. Their response is simply, they're amazed. So the disciples are amazed, and then they ask a question. And they don't ask again, why did you do this? And, and what does it mean that you killed this tree? They said, how did the fig tree wither all at once? Where, where did this power come from? What an amazing display of power. And the question seems to be, well, I mean, how did that actually happen? And so Jesus is going to give them some instruction. So let's look in verse 21. And Jesus answered and said to them, 
He's not going to tell them exactly how the power went out. He's not going to describe to them the nature of his power. He's going to relate his exercise of power to their ability to exercise the power necessary to accomplish the work that he will give them. So Jesus is going to make a very pointed and important uh, application of this work that he has done in cursing the fig tree, of this miracle, as it were. So he gives them this instruction. And really, I would like to boil this down into two principles that he gives to them. First is that faithful prayer enables Christ-like effectiveness. Jesus answered and said to them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. Now, we've heard Jesus say similar things in Matthew 17 where he talked, this very same phrase was used, where he told them, nothing will be impossible for you. So they're amazed at the power, and Jesus is now going to turn this demonstration of his power into an instruction to them that through prayer, they will be able to exhibit or to, to use the very power of God to accomplish the work that they have been given. But we need to work our way carefully here. Because he, he says, look, if, through prayer, he said, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but you will say to this mountain, be taken up. So they're going to walk around blasting fig trees. They're going to walk around casting mountains into the sea. Is that what Jesus is actually saying? So he's saying, the power that I exhibited, you will exhibit to do these physical things or this physical withering and then the amazing thought of taking a mountain and casting it into the sea. I would say, no. The idea is not that he's giving them power over fig trees or power over mountains, the idea is that he's giving them power to accomplish the work that he gave them to do. Jesus, and that's why I think it's so important that we understand that in cursing the fig tree, Jesus is doing more than just simply killing a tree. That he is actually exercising his kingly right or demonstrating his kingly right to rebuke his people because they have rejected him. And so I, I think the first thought here is when he says, you will do this same thing if you have faith. And as we'll see, it relates it directly to prayer in the next verse. If you have faith, then you too will be able to proclaim properly the judgment upon the nations that you are supposed to. You too will be able to proclaim the gospel and have gospel power to accomplish the work that I give you. Anything that you need to do, we, you will be able to accomplish. Anything that I did, that is that I set the, you the example to do, you too will be able to accomplish. So you don't have to be so amazed at my power. You need to be amazed that I am going to give that power to you to accomplish the, and to be effective like I am. That's an amazing promise. I mean, that's a stunning promise. He said to them, look, don't be so amazed at this power. You're going to have it. I'm going to grant you, if you will have faith, and as we will see, if you will pray, I am going to grant you the kind of power that I just exhibited in blasting this tree to proclaim the gospel to the nations, to declare their their judgment, to call them to repentance, all of these things that you will need to do, because you've seen me do this, I'm now promising you that you will have the ability to do what I call you to do. And that this power, in essence, hear me carefully, is limitless. There is no limit to the power of God to grant to his people the ability to do what he has called them to do. None. There is no limit to it whatsoever except the bounds that scripture places that power in. That's important for us to understand. That's why he uses the term that you will be able to move mountains, rooters of mountains. It was a, actually a fairly common phrase used of rabbis and others who seem to have amazing effectiveness. It was used in Jewish language. Jesus uses it here as hyperbole, as a metaphor. Both are metaphors. Although the fig tree actually was withered, he isn't saying you're going to wither fig trees. You're going to accomplish similar work. As you're going to accomplish gospel work, the things that I am doing, even in rejecting or in, in condemning my people because they refuse to reject me as Messiah, you are going to proclaim that message as well. And there's going to be no limit to the power that you will have exhibited by this promise that you can cast mountains into the sea. So mountains is an illustration or the moving of mountains is an illustration that nothing will be impossible for them. That is nothing that God would accomplish. The disciples were in awe of Christ's power to perform the miracle. But Jesus assures them that through prayer, they like him will be able to accomplish what God has given them to do. They too would pronounce judgment. They too would call people to repentance. They too would declare the nature of the power of God and they would call people to respond to the king, to the Messiah. Again, there's only one caveat that's given here 
concerning the amazing nature of that power. And that's that there had, it had to be accompanied with faith. They had to have faith and do not doubt. So back in our text, 22 says, in all things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. So when he says to them that they are to do these things in faith and not doubt, he, he in verse 22 gives the general principle, which is this begins with prayer. So all the things that you will do, the things that you will accomplish, begin with faithful prayer. As he says, all things you ask. So the second principle here is that faithful prayer enables all ministry. So the first principle, faithful prayer, enables Christ-like effectiveness. We will be able to do the things that Jesus did, not his direct actions, but accomplishing the work that he did that he laid the groundwork for. This is so important when it comes to understanding what it means to pray in faith and receive what it means to exercise the power of Christ, what it means that we would do greater things that Jesus did. It does not and cannot mean that we would do greater miracles than he did as far as his effect on physical objects. Nobody calms the sea. Nobody feeds 4,000 people, 5,000 people. He's not saying that he never was. And clear, I think it's made even more clear here in a miracle like this where he says, look, you're going to wither fig trees. The idea is, again, you're going to accomplish the work that I give you to do. I have the power to do what I'm called to do. You have the power to do what you are called to do. And all of this begins with faithful prayer. Faithful prayer enables us to accomplish the work that God has given us. Now, certainly, this cannot mean, when he says in verse 22, all things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive, it cannot mean anything and everything that any person might desire and pray for. It cannot mean that. We understand that. We ought to understand that. Unfortunately, our faith healers of today and our prosperity gospel preachers of today do not understand that. And they proclaim a mis- an entire misunderstanding of this particular passage. Proclaiming, you can pray for anything, anything you want in the name of Christ. That's ludicrous. It's ridiculous. Certainly, everything is not within the will of God. And your very prayer does not change the decree of God to accomplish things that he was not planning to astounding no's in scripture will help us with this. Because you're saying, well, maybe it does mean that. Maybe we simply pray, it changes the decree of God, he changes his mind as it were, and we direct what God will do. That's what's being told to you today through television and other places. Well, that should mean then that anytime someone who prays in faith, who truly is a believer in God, they should be able to get what they want. Well, how does scripture bear that out? No. Two illustrations of no, and answer no to prayers, of those who clearly prayed in faith and who were living within God's will. One is Paul in the thorn in the flesh. You might remember in 1 Corinthians 12 that he prays three times that this second Corinthians that he, this, this thorn in the flesh will be removed. And what does God say? No. Directly tells him no. Why? Because it's not his will. So that certainly was in the revealed will of God that Paul would be delivered from this particular affliction, be it a person or be it a particular sickness. But God says no, because it is not within his decree. Think Paul is praying without faith? Now his answer, Jesus doesn't say, God doesn't say to him, no, you're praying without enough faith and so therefore I'm not giving it to you. He says, I'm not giving it to you because I want to humble you. You don't get a yes answer to this prayer. So prayer does not and cannot change the will of God his decree. But there's a more staggering no answer that you probably already are thinking about. The one person in the world who could never have been praying without faith, who had to have the proper amount of faith, even Paul, we could say, well, maybe he didn't have enough. There's one person who could never be praying without sufficient faith, and that is whom? Jesus. And when he is in the garden, and when he asks for the cup to be removed, God says no. The decree of God cannot be changed by a prayer, even of a faithful person. We need to remember that. And that needs to be reminded to our false teachers and to our prophets of, of, of prosperity who say that you can pray anything. You can not. Now, I don't mean to in any way take away from the power of this. Even with the necessary caveats of what will not be provided, this remains a, a breathtaking and wonderful promise. God will always provide what is necessary because it is true that he will provide what is necessary for his will to be done, if you're praying and God is answering no, then you can rest assured that you don't need it. You can rest absolutely assured, comforted in the middle of the night when God is not answering your prayer, that it is not necessary for you at this time to have it, and that he will make sufficient provision for you in another way. Absolute confidence that that will happen, because God cannot keep, will not keep anything from you that is necessary for you to accomplish his work. It's a, it's a 
breathtaking promise. He says in Matthew 17, 20, as I mentioned, nothing will be impossible for you. Nothing that is necessary to accomplish God's work according to God's will and his word will be impossible. That should cause you to rejoice and it should drive you to prayer. Now, I'm gonna spend the rest of my time this morning considering the idea because you might be thinking, all right, all right I see that or, or maybe I can understand that. But my great worry is that I'm not praying in faith. What about that? Because maybe I'm praying and you said, well, I'm not going to receive everything. I get that. But I feel like I'm not perhaps getting what I'm praying for because I just don't have enough faith. What does it mean to pray in faith? I'd like to touch that this morning because I think that's really important. First and foremost, I, I, I would like to say that having faith or the prayer of faith is not simply believing that God has the power to answer. It is that. It begins with that. God certainly does have that power. And if you don't believe that he has the power to answer it, why are you praying in the first place, right? But I would say that for most of you, the baseline is this. You believe that. And I would ask you, how much harder do you have to believe it? Do you have to jump up and down? Do you have to grunt? Do you have to fall on your face in order to somehow generate a greater belief that God can do what he says he can do? You can't do that. It's like getting on an escalator. You're on or off. You're on the elevator or you're not. You believe that he can do that or you don't. So beginning with the understanding that God has the power to answer prayer, it starts with that, but it's more than that. And yet it isn't somehow cranking up the belief factor in some way that seems, you know, it's mystical to you. How do I do this? Do I have to sweat when I pray? So praying in faith, I think, needs to be understood as one, believing certainly that God can do it. So you can write these down. They're not on your outline. But certainly once believing that God has the power to do this. But I would say, and might encourage you, that the vast majority of you sitting here this morning believe that. And when you pray, you believe that God has the power to answer because you're a Christian. And God, God radically saved you and snatched you out of darkness so you know he has power and you believe it. So I, I think most of you do. But there are additional factors that have to do with praying in faith without doubting. So it is to believe, certainly, that God can do what he says. Secondly, believing or praying in faith is believing everything the scripture says. Promises, commands, and condemnations. You can't pray according to God's will if you don't know and believe the word of God. 1 John five fourteen. This is the confidence which we have before him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it shall be done for you. The second condition for faithful prayer is that you believe the word of God. Now let me encourage you again. I think most of you do. You read the word of God and you go, that's true. I believe it. I take it to the bank. I believe the promises. I believe the condemnations. I don't think you'd be sitting here if you didn't. So I think most of you, maybe not all of you, but most of you believe God has the power. I believe most of you are convinced that scripture is true. You know a lot of scripture and you believe it. So there's the second condition fulfilled. Third, to pray in faith, you have to have a right, biblical, God-glorifying motive that grounds your prayer. I don't know, this one's a little more dicey and we oftentimes can pray with wrong motives. But you might be saying, no, wait a minute. You're, you're bringing in too much about the prayer of faith. I, I, you know, how do we know we have to have right motives? Well, I think you're probably already thinking of a verse. How about James 4, 3? You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. Why? So that you may spend it on your pleasures. But, but let me encourage you with something. I'm absolutely convinced that most of you do not get on your knees selfishly every morning just wanting your own pleasure. You might at times, there might be times when you wrestle with that, as I do, but I don't believe for a moment that the majority of you pray that way. You pray because you long to see God's work done. You long to see his church built. You long to see family members coming to Christ, not for some selfish reason, but because they're gonna die in hell if they don't. So that's a condition met by most of you. And again, we wrestle with that. That can go up and down. We can certainly pray with greedy motives but I think for most of us, as we wrestle through it, we confess those and we move on in a prayer of faith. Well, there's a fourth thing that it means to pray in faith, to pray consistently and persistently, even when it seems that God is not answering. Luke 18, one. Now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. So another part of faithful prayer is that you just keep praying. But I ask you, if I, were to, if I were to have hands raised here as to how often you have been praying for certain things in your life that have not yet come to be, I would, I would, if I asked you if you've been praying days, months, years for some of those things, there would be hands all over this auditorium. We've been praying faithfully and persistently for years. So there's another condition that's cared for. 
for the vast majority of you. You do pray consistently. Now, I'm not trying to let you off the hook. Have you stopped praying for something you should? We'll start. Have you not been consistent or persistent? We'll be that because God is faithful and your faithful prayer in persistence is part of his means by which he accomplishes his work. But I think that most of you are probably praying consistently and persistently. A fifth thing that it means to pray in faith is to pray believing that God is kind and gracious and desiring of, answer, of answering the prayers of his children. Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith is it impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. Do you believe that? I think most of you do. I don't think you'd be sitting here if you didn't think God was a rewarder, if you didn't think he was the faithful one who blesses, if you didn't believe that he was your father who loves you and longs to give to you. You know that. That's why you appeal to him. You forget it sometimes. I get it. So do I. But the vast majority of times you appeal to a God that you know is your loving father who wants to answer your prayers. You're well taught. And I think for most of you, you're well acting in the, I talk to you, I hear that. I, I know that you know this to be true. You, pl- you pray, believing that God is kind and gracious. When you're struggling, I, sometimes you don't. But I think for the vast majority of time, you do. But there's yet a sixth thing that it means to pray with faith, to pray with a sincere desire for God to actually accomplish his work and will, even if it means your humility or difficulty or denial. James 1, 6, but he must ask in faith without any doubting. For he who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. I think we understand the doubt there is praying and then not really wanting God to accomplish that thing. That is praying for holiness but not wanting to do the work that would cause holiness to, to work in our hearts, not wanting to give up the sin. So we pray on one hand and yet we don't want to give up our sin on the other hand. That's, that's what it means to doubt. I'm praying here but I don't really want that to happen. Well, I, that can be true for us. I think we can wrestle to not want the, the actual you know, the, the fullness of what God would provide if we gave that prayer. But I don't think that's true for most of you. I think most of you desire that when you pray for something that you long for God to do it, even when you know it's going to be hard, even if you know there were things that he would require of you through that prayer to accomplish, I think that most of you desire that. And in fact, most of you are doing that. The hard work to pursue holiness, the hard work to evangelize, the hard work that comes along with prayer. Because that's what it means to pray without doubting. Another condition fulfilled. Well, a seventh thing that's necessary if we're going to pray, and the last one that I have for this morning, if we're going to pray in faith, is that we pray while living a life of obedience. Faithful prayer means a faithful life. Like, well, Chris, still, it seems like you're adding all kinds of conditions to prayer. I don't think so. I've given you verses for each one. I'll give you a verse for this one, 1 John three twenty-two. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Faithful prayer requires faithful action obedience and yet again this is not the hammer you are just not getting your prayers answers because none of you here are obedient enough well some of you might not be and that's why you're not getting your prayers answered because you're living a life of wanton sin but I don't think that's most of you right you're living a life that longs to be obedient you long to be faithful you long to be holy and so this life of obedience is something that you live. And so the prayers that you, pray, you are praying are prayers in faith. And so if you're not being answered, what does it mean? That God is telling you that you don't need that now. That perhaps it will come later. That perhaps it will never come. That God is telling you that he loves you and that he's going to accomplish his work. And you've seen many prayers answered. Don't forget those. The prayers that aren't are the things that God is saying. It's not time now. It's not what's necessary now. But you can be absolutely confident that he is not ignoring you. And that someone, there's not some deficiency in you. Again, I'm not telling you don't, don't examine yourselves. I'm not saying don't consider each one of those things and determine, well, maybe I'm not praying in faith, but I would say again that for most of you, you're praying in faith, and when God is saying no, it means you don't need it, and you can absolutely trust him that he will provide when it's time. This promise guarantees it, that he will provide and that he will give you the strength you need to accomplish his work, and that all things that he desires will be accomplished as we pray in faith, because the prayer in faith is essentially simply Christianity 101. To obey his word, to know his word, to know truly the person and work of God, to understand the nature of who Jesus is and what he's done, and to pray in light of those things. These are the things that it means, and I I pray that you will be encouraged by that.
And so a couple thoughts and, and questions for you as you, as you consider the, the, the joyfulness of this promise as well as the amazing combination with a, really a condemnation of Israel that really is part of what we will ultimately do, not with Israel, but in a condemnation of sin in the world and the proclamation of the gospel so that people will receive their king truly. A couple thoughts. Are you perhaps like the fig tree? You do look good on the outside, but there's no true fruit. Remember that you will not be allowed to continue in this condition. Jesus said, in through this parable, Israel, you're done. No more time. The fig tree is cursed. Please know that you will not always be able to live with that hypocrisy. You will one day be found out. Either it will be at judgment day, or it will be at some time before that, and I pray that it will be at some time before that, that you might repent and believe, that the gospel work of those around you would be effective, their prayers for you, because if you are a hypocrite here this morning, somebody knows, and somebody's praying for you. Yield. Let the power of God work in your heart. Repent and believe. Are your prayers focused? Question two would be, are your prayers focused on the work of the kingdom? With a passion to see all that desires that God desires to come about. Because that's the prayer Jesus is talking about. It's focused on his kingdom. It's focused on accomplishing his work and his will, even as that involves the salvation of your loved ones and the health of those that you know. All of that has to be revolving around kingdom work. What is God doing? And our prayers are directed in that way. Do you have confidence that God is still working powerfully in the world, that he desires to use you and your prayers to accomplish his work? Do you, do you believe that? I think you do. Don't forget it. Do you persistently pray for things that God's word reveals are within the will of God? Faithfully crying out to God to show his power through the salvation of souls and the building of his church. And are you living that faithful life out of which powerful prayer flows, constantly deepening in your faith and thus experiencing the joy of answered prayer? That's my hope for you. Oh, I just want to give you one, one other thought as relates to this faithful prayer, and that's that you would be engaged with this church in the work of prayer that we do. Be it on a Sunday morning that you would work to see, perhaps you could come and pray with us. Most importantly, and the thing that I want to focus on as far as our corporate prayer or the ways that, that we as a church and elders are trying to develop prayer in this church would be our fellowship groups. We gather together in fellowship groups, which will be starting in a couple of weeks, for the purpose, one of the primary purposes is that we might pray powerfully in these ways. We could have a church prayer meeting on a Wednesday night. We could do that. We'd get 20 people, maybe 25. When we gather in our fellowship groups, we get perhaps 120, 130, maybe more. It'd be wonderful to have 250 or 260 people gathering in separate locations throughout the city every week on their knees, praying for the needs of the church and praying for the needs of the world. That's part of what you do in a fellowship group. Now you can, do, you can pray individually. You ought to be. There's all kinds of opportunities for you to do that. But these are the opportunities that we are fostering because we understand that this promise is real. We, the elders, believe it. We are then seeking to give you opportunity to express your belief in it as well. Because there is work to be done. And there is a world to be changed. And there is a community that desperately needs more gospel light shown. And it will all begin with prayer. All of it. So join us. Join us. If you can't, again, if you can't come, if you can't do those corporate things that we do, find a way to do it. Gather together, pray, seek the Lord, and pray believing without doubting in a faithful life, and we will see what God will do. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time. Thank you for this powerful promise. Thank you that you give us your power to accomplish your work and that you do not leave us somehow having to accomplish it in our own strength. That anything and everything which you require of us is possible as we pray in faith. And I thank you that you give us the power for faith. The faith is not our own. The faith is not generated by our, our somehow believing harder, but simply believing and then living out the realities of that belief. And Father, I pray for this church. Lord, I ask that we would be a faithful people of prayer. And I thank you for this church. I, I believe this is true. I've seen it. I hear it. And I'm so thankful for the faithful prayers of this body. I pray that we would just be more faithful. It would be used of you in powerful ways as we pray in faith without doubting and watch your work be accomplished. In your precious name, Lord Jesus, amen.